Hello, my beautiful doves. If you follow me on Instagram, you might have noticed uh, last week, I think, I posted a poll on this video, like what video should I do? And Over the Garden Wall won by a slight margin. So who would I be if I denied the popular vote? So this is what we're gonna be doing today. For those of you who don't know, Over the Garden Wall is an animated miniseries that aired um, on Cartoon Network in 2014. It's Halloween themed, so it is the perfect October watch if you have yet to be initiated. It follows the journey of two half-brothers, Wirt and Greg, who get lost in this endless forest called The Unknown and try to journey back home. The series is broken up into 10 10 minute episodes and each episode feels like an old American folk tale slash grim fairy tale slash Victorian ghost story. Without giving too much away, The Unknown is like a fantasy place, but it does draw a lot of real world inspirations from historical time periods. And um, those inspirations are what we're gonna be looking at today. There will be some spoilers in this video because I'm going to be talking about the characters that show up in the episodes, but um, I will not be divulging any major plot points or really just going near the plot like at all. So yeah, with that said, let's start with Wirt. Wirt is the older brother. Wirt's costume has been up for debate among fans since the show aired because he's supposed to be wearing a Halloween costume, but we don't really know what it is. The cape looks like it's a Union infantry soldier cape that was probably a family heirloom. One of his peers asks if he's a gnome from the pointy hat, which he doesn't verify or deny. So what are you, Wirt? Some kind of gnome? I, I, I don't know. Well, see, I was, I thought I'd just... Like... Hey, what's this? I think he just like assembles random things that were lying around in his house um, to make a costume that made him feel confident or that made him just feel good because he does have low self-esteem. But then as we see him um, interact with his schoolmates and they question what he's wearing, he starts to second guess himself. More proof that he doesn't have a legitimate costume is that he's wearing two different shoes throughout the whole series. The costume choice for sure demonstrates Wirt's eclectic personality, multiple niche interests, and highlights the general uncertainty and confusion he feels about his own identity. <sighs> I don't know. Sometimes I feel like I'm just like a boat upon a winding river, twisting towards an endless black sea, uh, <clears throat> further and further drifting away from where I want to be, who I want to be. Greg, on the other hand, is our sunshine child. He's very sure of himself and in his own weirdness. He never tries to conform to his peers and he's consistently asking questions that are outside the box. Do you like waffles? No, waffles make me sick. I eat maggots. Ah! What? How can you not eat waffles? <gasps> ah! His costume is an elephant costume, and the only thing about this costume that is different from his everyday wear is that he is wearing a tea kettle on his head to resemble the elephant trunk. This shows how creative and unique he is, but also the audience is not actually supposed to know that it's Halloween until much later. So for the majority of the series, we're just kind of guessing why Greg is wearing a tea kettle on his head, and that obviously leads to our overall first impression of him. And unlike Wirt, who has no idea who he is and no idea what he's supposed to be for Halloween, Greg knows exactly what he's supposed to be for Halloween, which alludes to him just being sure of who he is in general. Patrick McHale, the show's creator, also said he went for a Johnny Appleseed look for Greg. I don't know if there's a deeper meaning behind that or if the Johnny Appleseed look was following the autumnal American theme of the show. Um, if I was really going to look into it, Johnny Appleseed is a hero who plants trees, which kind of alludes to Greg's role in the show. Kind of. That might be a stretch. The Woodsman is the first character the boys meet in the series. I just want to point out quickly that the Woodsman literally has the same voice actor as Rasputin from Anastasia. And when I found that out, I just couldn't watch the show without the montage of Rasputin's dismembered body parts bouncing around in the back of my mind. <laughs> anyway, according to Nick Cross, the art director, the Woodsman was designed with a 1700s hairstyle. I didn't have too much knowledge going into this about men's fashion and hairstyles, uh, to be completely honest, but I was kind of shocked to read that because he looks to be wearing mid to late 1800s clothing. He's wearing tall leather boots, a frock coat that flares at the bottom in fashion with the time period, and a top hat. The top hat was the most common men's hat of the 19th century, by the way. 
Beatrice, who is also a resident near the old grist mill, wears a dress and hairstyle that are very reminiscent of the Regency period, placing her around the 1810s. This dress is a very fashionable high-waisted empire dress with puffed sleeves and a loosely falling skirt. During the Regency period, fashion started to follow ancient Greek and Roman styles, particularly in the way that dresses draped on women. The ideal silhouette became one that was more natural, and so tight corsets were abandoned for a time. The blue hue of her dress is pretty unlikely for someone of her status. So vibrant colors were very expensive because it usually took multiple dyeing sessions for the color to take well. And also blue is a very unnatural color and therefore harder to achieve. Sometimes rich women would hand off their old dresses to their maids or servants, um, but it doesn't seem like Beatrice was working for anyone. So I don't think she would have gotten this dress from an employer. Also, the particular shade of blue, which looks like a cerulean, was created by mixing cobalt and copper during the Regency era, and so it had a tendency to fade to green very easily. Rich ladies actually prefer to wear the same dress only once, especially with a dress that's like this vibrant of a color, because the dress would fade super fast either through washing or through sun exposure. I do understand the significance of her wearing blue because she is a bluebird. It just wouldn't be super historically accurate. Miss Langtree's character design is probably one of the most obvious to attribute a time period to, but in The Art of Over the Garden Wall, Mikhail explains that Miss Langtree's design was based on 1800s paintings of women reading books and letters by the windows. However, from her clothes and hairstyle, I would say she looks like she's designed from the early 1900s. She's wearing a pompadour hairstyle, which is probably the most defining hairstyle of the Edwardian period. The shape is high, rounded, and curved away from the head. In real life, hair was also drawn over a pompadour wireframe, or a rat, which is what they called a matted pad or roll of hair. For her clothes, Miss Langtree is wearing a brown walking skirt and an off-white, high-collared shirtwaist with button details going down the middle. The shirtwaist was the ideal workwear blouse for women in the 1900s. It was also a symbol of white women's newfound independence, as well as just the start of progressive gender ideas. More women during this time than ever before started to work and earn their own wages, and because of that, they had slightly more independence from their husbands. Of course, this is all minuscule compared to today's uh, gender progressive ideals, though it could be more progressive, but I digress. It was still a huge deal for the turn of the century. If I was to critique the silhouette, I would say that the chest area should be sticking out more because during this time, corsets emphasized a pigeon-breasted shape. But the final character design is pretty stellar for 2D animation. The people of the tavern are some of my favorite minor characters in the entire series. I just want to pull out a few costumes that stood out to me though because there are a lot of outfits in this sequence. Let's start with the tavern keeper. She's wearing a pretty standard 18th to 19th century peasant costume. She's wearing a dress, an apron, a bonnet, and a shawl. Now it's hard to place her in a more exact time period because one, um, peasants tended to rewear the same clothes a lot because being able to afford a new dress was very costly, which is why a lot of peasant fashions are several years behind um, the aristocratic fashions. And two, there's just in general, not that much information when it comes to peasant attire. And this is because, as I said before, peasants would rewear the same clothes a lot more often. A lot of these garments were not in good enough conditions to survive to our modern day. Royal clothing, in contrast, was not worn as often and not subjected to rigorous labor, so they were left in good condition, and consequently, we have quite a lot of them in museum collections. The tavern keeper is also wearing cameo jewelry, which is basically jewelry that has a face carved into it. Cameo jewelry was definitely most popular during the Victorian era, but it did exist in previous periods, so I guess it wouldn't be too crazy for her to be wearing one. <laughs> The tailor is giving major Benjamin Franklin vibes. The hairstyle and the glasses are literally the exact same. Coincidence? I think not! This ensemble looks like it's from around the 1770s, which I will talk about more a little later in the video. The master looks like the poster boy of a Regency dandy from the high standing collar, the frock coat that is cropped in the front with tails in the back, the waistcoat underneath, the cravat tied around the neck, the top boots, which were boots with turned down tops, and the Mr. Dicey hairstyle. 
The apprentice threw me off a little bit because at first glance, he looks to be wearing a rough collar, which fell out of style after the 1600s. However, he's actually wearing a skeleton suit, which was popular attire for young boys in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. But it's not completely accurate. The skeleton suit consisted of buttoned pants and a tight jacket that was usually buttoned to the pants, but it could all just be one piece as well. During the Regency time period, the skeleton suit followed the fashionable high-waisted silhouette. However, the apprentice's suit is loose, the jacket isn't tight to the pants, and the pants are not high-waisted. UNACCEPTABLE! Usually boys would wear white blouses with ruffle trims underneath their jackets though, which explains the rough imposter. In this episode, we meet Quincy Endicott. Mikhail said that Endicott was inspired by George Washington. I think the British thing was played up because of Endicott's tea business, but from my understanding, Endicott is supposed to be American. Mikhail actually said that he imagined Endicott to have a British accent despite being American because um, he assumed that the American accent took a long time to develop. And in the early colonial days, George Washington probably had a British accent. Now I'm not a linguist, so I can't verify whether or not that's accurate, but it does sound kind of correct. Endicott's mansion was also designed to look like Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. So Wirt makes a correct observation that Endicott's tastes are very Georgian. That doesn't really seem in line with Endicott's Georgian sensibilities. The Georgian time period is roughly from 1714 to 1837. And just as a side note, the Regency era, which I've mentioned a couple times, is a sub-period of the Georgian era. Taking a look at paintings and fashion plates from this time, Endicott looks almost exactly like a man of the 1770s. See, I told you we would come back to this time period. Endicott wears a fitted plain coat that is cut away forming curving tails. He wears a waistcoat underneath. He wears a cravat tied in a bow tie, breeches, stockings, and shoes fastened with buckles. Marguerite, who is in the same episode, has a French accent and she is based on Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette ruled from 1774 to 1783, which is further evidence that this episode takes place around the 1770s. In contrast with Endicott's, her mansion is supposed to resemble Versailles. As far as her dress goes, she definitely looks less accurate to the times than Endicott does, I would say. Her hairstyle draws an immediate parallel to Marie Antoinette, but her dress doesn't have the bells and whistles that you come to expect from an aristocrat. She wears a short jacket, which is reasonable undress attire. Undress attire is basically what we call like informal casual wear during this time period. Um, but of course, it's also relative. Undress costume still looks quite formal compared to our modern day version of lounge clothes. Most short jackets of this era had a peplum. Marguerite's kind of looks like it might have a peplum, but it's sometimes hard to tell details like that in 2D animation. For a more historically accurate costume design, I would exaggerate the peplum a little bit more so that it's longer and outward flaring uh, to resemble more of like a Caraco jacket. She's also wearing a fichu, which is a triangular shawl that is draped over the shoulders and fastened at the front. Moving on to the next episode. The frog boat scene is pretty interesting. We have a lot of characters here. The frogs seem to be somewhere between the 1910s and 1920s. Most of the female frogs wear Edwardian-esque tea dresses and these pretty ostentatious wide-brimmed hats decorated with feathers and flowers. Sometimes these hats were so wide that women would have to pin the hats to their heads to keep them in place. Frogs obviously don't have hair, so I guess these ones are not pinned. The male frogs are wearing bowler hats, boater hats, and top hats. This dashing sir is wearing a morning suit, which consists of a tailcoat, a vest, trousers, and a top hat. These men's outfits are pretty standard for the 1910s and 1920s. The real differences between these two eras when it comes to men's suits is like the slight changes in silhouette and fit and like the small details which obviously because uh, the characters are frogs and because of the limitations of 2D animation it's kind of hard to tell those things. There is a one female frog that looks different from the others. She looks like she's wearing a 1920s tubular drop waist dress. Again, it's hard to tell exactly, but the hemline is way shorter and looks to be embellished with feathered trim, which was a stylish detail of the 1920s. And finally, let's discuss Lorna. Lorna is wearing 17th century colonial clothing. I only refer to her as a colonial because the unknown is mostly based in New England, but commoners all across Europe dressed relatively similarly in the 1600s. 
Lorna is wearing a waistcoat, an apron, and a petticoat. Just to clarify, outer skirts at the time were called petticoats, but women would still wear extra petticoats underneath as underlayers. I think they were just called the same thing. It's a little bit confusing, but yeah. Her dress is pretty nice and a vibrant blue-green shade, so I assume it was handed down to her from a rich employer. Her costume is actually pretty accurate. If I were to nitpick, I would say that she looks to be wearing one single garment. As we can see from these photos, the waistcoat should more prominently look like its own layer. Also, many laboring women at the time would wear a large square of linen folded or tied around the neck, which would keep the neck warm in the cold and also act as another layer of modesty. Because as we know, the Puritans love their modesty. <laughs> oh my god, look at that hand-on-hand -hand action. If I don't do something, soon they'll be exchanging pleasantries. So this is the end of the video. Thank you so much for tuning in. If I missed any references, please let me know. Or if there's any other references that are not clothing related, I would love to know those as well. I try to rewatch this show once a year and I've already done my yearly relaunch. So that's my endorsement. If you haven't seen it already, I hope this compels you to give it a watch. Anyways, I'll see you next time and I hope Hope you'll have a lovely day.